It's a bird. It's a man. It's a lovely girl. It's Florida, land of strand of mysterious Everglades. Land of tropical sunsets that provide golden halos for a colonnade of shrimp boats masts. Land of... Florida. It certainly has its reputation for deranged incidents. Being the center of countless jokes, memes, and news articles, mocking its inhabitants' strange behavior and the unusual crimes that occur in the state, gives it a bit of a stained reputation. Not all Floridian criminals are hellbent on making everyone else's lives miserable in the silliest of ways, though. One case I stumbled upon, or rather, was presented with at a young age has always intrigued me. A case that isn't a joke. An unsolved murder that remains cold to this day. One that remains very close to my heart. These are the murders of Geddes and Merrill Lee. As a child, I lived near Geddes Lee Road, a road named after the good old Geddes, a name that would otherwise mean nothing to me, until my grandfather brought it up. My grandfather loved to scare me as a young child. Call it whatever you want, but now I look back at the memories with joy. A certain scary story he told me caught my attention, mainly because it occurred not far from where I grew up. He told me about Geddes Lee, the man who was murdered in Parrish. His horror story was that if you drove down Erie Road on a dark, rainy night, you would see him there standing on the side of the road with his head all covered in blood, reaching out toward you. Something to scare the hell out of a kid like me, but as much as it scared me, it caused me to desire more knowledge about the truth behind this tall tale. As I aged, the Lee murders were always something in the back of my mind, a story of terror and mystery that saddened me in its unsolved darkness that I had heard discussed around my family members throughout the years, mostly coming from the grandparents on both sides of my family. Growing up, I was told Geddes Lee was an extremely rich man who was killed for his money when he refused to give it up, and that they never cut the killer. This story likely came from a sort of game of telephone, as the story was passed from the truth and changed from person to person when the information was finally tossed over to me. Luckily, most of this version of the story is accurate, though in my growing curiosity as I aged, I became overwhelmed with the need for answers. For years, I have researched around the trusted web for Geddes Lee's murder, and in my studies, the most I found was mediocre. I could find almost no news sources talking about this unsolved cold case, save for the Bradenton Herald's tiny little paragraph explaining the basics of the story, stuff I pretty much already knew. Any other article was just a basic regurgitation of the same short paragraph of limited information. Did anyone know about this? I knew the basics, but I wanted details. I wanted the deep, juicy innards of the story because it maddened me that it was unsolved. At the beginning of my studies, I believed the only image of Geddes Lee existing on the internet was this. A picture of an older man turned to the side, standing next to a car. What I have learned in my time researching this topic is that there's always more if you keep looking, keep trying. With time, there will come a new source. Something will show up. You cannot give up, as I almost did. 
With my limited information and knowledge of this case and the seemingly dry records around the web, I considered trashing my documentary. As I sat defeated, my knuckles pressed against my pulsing temples, my mind swirling with thoughts, doubts, and the thirst for answers. Something in me decided it wasn't time to give up just yet. By the grace of God, in the year 2021, an article was released on TrueCrimeDiva.com, one that explained the murders and failed investigation in full, bloody, and disgusting detail. This is what I'd been looking for, exactly what I needed. I could not have created this without them. So please, go and check out this article by True Crime Diva. It was an incredible help with the creation of this documentary. I will link my sources in the description of this video. And so, the truth unfolds before my very eyes. First, we must travel back in time to 1957. Geddes Lee and his wife, Merrill, lived on 121st Avenue East Parish, Florida, in their home built in the 1930s. The Lees never had children. People say Merrill was a recluse and rarely got out of the house, unlike her husband, who owned a general store, a farm with over 100 cows and four citrus groves. He was often referred to as the unofficial mayor of Parrish. He was known for carrying around thousands in his pocket, flaunting his wealth. He never mistreated his wife, though. He was known to be a womanizer, constantly taking lovers other than his wife that were much younger than he. On Friday, March 8th, 1957, the day after a terrible storm made its way through Parrish, Lee was missing from his store. This was the first time in 30 years he'd been late. It was very unlike him, so obviously people were confused. An employee of Mr. Lee, Donald A. Dorrance, drove out to the Lee's house and found three lights on and the door open, but the Lee's were missing. Durrance reported this to the local police and was questioned by the sheriff at the time, Roy Baden. Merrill's belongings were inside the house, and nothing suggested that anything out of the ordinary had happened in there. A large search for the Lees began, and William McKinley Smiley led the investigation. They traced Mr. Lee up to a certain point. He had bought some dinners for a lover of his, but what he did after, no one knows. There were neighbors that lived across the street from the Lees that had seen Merrill the night before. In 2015, Miss Vivian said in an interview that Miss Lee told her she'd been combing her hair when she saw someone outside her room watching her. There are witnesses that claim they saw a car outside of Lee's store on March 7th as well. Soon, police found Geddes Lee's car, 12 miles southwest of Parrish, abandoned. It was locked and had Lee's hat inside. The hat had a bullet hole in it with no bloodstains, only lead particles. The next day, Stanley Wegched spotted blood on the shoulder of Erie Road. He stopped and got out to investigate. Upon further inspection, he came across Merrill Lee's beaten body, slashed with a sharp instrument, lying face down, curled in a canal. She was fully dressed. She had been shot four times in the neck, head, side, and knee. Her death occurred between 9 and 11.30 p.m. on March 7th, according to authorities. June 8th, the savage murder of Miss Merrill Lee, 60, and the sinister disappearance of her philandering husband, wealthy Geddes Lee, 63, of Parrish, moved towards fresh snarls yesterday as a court battle loomed over the couple's sizable Manatee County estate. Investigators for the Florida Sheriff's Bureau belatedly called into the weird murder case after it was nearly three months old were struggling to sift the mass of rumor, conjecture, and scandal that has kept Manatee County seething in its wonderment and fear since Miss Lee's battered, gashed, and bullet-punctured body was found March 9th. At the same time, Tampa relatives of the murdered woman moved to claim her estate, which is now being administered by the mother of the missing man. 
83-year-old Mrs. Elizabeth Lee of Parrish. The looming contest over the estate is presented with the same problem that makes the Lee case one of Florida's strangest mysteries, the whereabouts of Geddes Lee. Is he dead or alive? And if he's dead, who died first, he or his wife? The autopsy established that Mrs. Lee died the night of March 7th, sometime between 9 and 11 o'clock, but no trace of Lee, other than his bullet-pierced hat and his abandoned locked car, has been found. If it is ever determined that Lee died first, then the property in his name would go to his wife, and then her relatives. If it should turn out Mrs. Lee died first, then her share of the property would become part of her husband's estate and go to the Lee relatives. Mrs. Lee's relatives, in applying for joint custody of Mrs. Lee's estate, are proceeding on the theory that if the hour of Lee's death can't be proven, it may be assumed the couple died simultaneously, and therefore they would be entitled to half of the couple's estate. So the mystery of the Lee's fate becomes of importance not only in satisfying justice by clearing up a heinous crime, but in determining who gets two orange groves in Manatee County, another tract in southern Hillsborough County, a herd of 100 or so cattle, the proceeds from a grocery store now being closed out, a home in Parrish, and at least $26,000 of citrus sale receipts now in a Bradenton bank. The whole Lee case has kept Manatee County in turmoil. There was no sign of Geddes. A large search was put out for Mr. Lee. Ponds were even drained, and all that the search found was a bloody t-shirt and scattered Bolita tickets and a shack in Ellington until six years later. May 11th, 1963, one and a half miles from Parrish, two men were pursuing a rattlesnake that they had shot and stumbled across a skeleton in the nearby bushes. The remains had been scattered around a 20-foot area over time. An old Parrish newspaper reads that Sheriff Ken Gross and his deputies rushed to the scene and began an intensive investigation which led to the conclusion that the skeleton was in fact Geddes Lee, the wealthy Manatee County grocer and Citrus Grove owner who'd been missing for the past six years. There had been no trace of Lee up until this moment. The skull of the skeleton had a bullet hole at the right rear base, and the jaw had dental plates confirmed by a Bradenton dentist to be Geddes Lee's. A thorough search through the surrounding area brought up several of Mr. Lee's belongings. A watch with the identification mark of a local watchmaker who had repaired it for Geddes two weeks before his disappearance. A tie clasp with the initial L on it. Shoes identified by Lee's sister to be his and some coins. The forest around the remains of Geddes Lee had been burned over every two years, destroying any paper money and clothing that could have surrounded the corpse. The Lee case went cold after leads ran dry. <laughs> And it, it, up there on the Geddes Lee Road, you go to the end and there's a two-story house, that's where he was raised. Sometimes he was real nice and sometimes he was ugly to other, not to me, but some of the other customers, he was pretty rough. I do know he had a temper. He did have a bad temper. Mm -hmm. and there, that empty spot over there where they had their house when all this happened. Uh, so. I didn't know Miss Merrill too much, but I did, I did know Gary Lee pretty well. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he's nice and sometimes he's me. Miss, Miss Merrill, she uh, lost two babies. And she had a hysterectomy when she was really young. And she, she was, got bad, her mind got bad shape. But other than that, no, there was nothing wrong with her. She used to have quilt parties, making quilts at her house. I could not understand why they took Miss Merrill. She, she was a good lady, and she did not leave home or do anything. But she had to know who was at her door. Because Sydney said that she never opens her door unless she knows you. So if come, somebody come to the door, that knew her, and she knew, and she let, she let him in. 
Why, that's a, that lady didn't know nothing. I mean, you know, she was so nice. She'd come over here every night and read the Bible to sit my husband's grandma. That's the type of person she was. But she knew who, whoever went in there, she knew. She didn't know nothing. She didn't know nothing. About nothing. It was storming that night. I mean, storming. And when I heard it, I, I, there was two loads, car loads of us going around trying to find where they were. We were going to old houses and places we knew. And then they went down, they, somebody told them they was in that pond or whatever you call it there by Oyster Bar. They drained that because they thought he was in there. And they drained that, but he wasn't. See, I lived on the Fort Hamer Road th then. We built a house on the Fort Hamer Road. And we went, we went hunting. Well, out there on that Rod Bridge Road, there was a dead dog right under the fence. And so, and there was buzzards. So me and my sister were standing out in our, my backyard. And she said, Vivian, let's see that's Mr. Geddes. I bet you there was 50 buzzards flying. And I said, well, don't you remember there was a dead dog? So we didn't go, but that's where he was, they found him. But he was not killed there. Roy Boyden says he knows for sure he didn't die at home, but he was shot in the head with his own gun with his hat on. And I think it had something to do with moonshine, and I'm not sure now. I do know he was in Belize, but that's the only that's the only gambling they told me they knew he did was mm -hmm. that Belize. So far as that his life like that, I didn't know, but. He, she, this woman he was running with had three brothers from Tampa. So, you know, you never know. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you get enough? I think so. <laughs> After our interview, Miss Vivian showed me some newspapers relating to the illegal moonshine trade back then and mentioned that she had an old moonshine still upstairs that was no longer in use. Of course, I had to check it out. And I got one upstairs. I don't use it, you know, I don't mess with it, but... The moonshine stills? Not that one. That one's in the fair. It, they do moonshine at night. And Uncle Buck seen a spotlight coming through the woods. A game warden was hunting them out there. Mm -hmm. So he climbed a tree and shot his light out. They said they didn't have no more trouble with him. So my granddaddy and his oldest boy was... And when they get to drinking, oh my God. But this is Wayne, and I said, uh, he says it's his granddaddy's, and he poured moonshine in there once in a while and make it smell like a moonshine. I said, Wayne, where in the world? That, that's, that's him right there. I said, where in the world did, did you make your moonshine? He said, in my bedroom. <laughs> No, it's against the law. You can't even make not enough, just one person to drink. Yeah, that's what I heard. Is that It, it is. I've got my still upstairs. Why? Well, I, I, no, I hadn't made no moves. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I just had it. I told them that was my heritage. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, cool. Can I, can I see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't go up there with you. You're going to have to go by yourself. Okay. Yes, um, I see it. That's it? That was just five gallons. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Hmm. It is five gallons. Wow. It's crazy. During my seemingly endless research on this subject, I stumbled across a Facebook post by the Bradenton Herald talking about the forgotten deaths of Mr. Lee and his wife. There were only two comments on the post, and one in particular caught my eye. A comment by someone by the name of Corin Shire, reading, The children of the sheriff and deputies are still alive. I'm one of them. 
my interest was piqued. I immediately messaged this person, praying I'd at least get an answer. I did. When I spoke with her, she told me she was 69 years old and was a daughter of a deputy very close to the sheriff at the time, Sheriff Roy Baden. Baden was elected for Manatee County Sheriff in 1942 and began a 17-year reign as Manatee's top law enforcement official, but 53-year-old Baden's reputation wasn't without controversy of its own. According to clippings from the Tampa Bay Times, criticism darkened Baden's image in 1956 when he was accused of failing to act against organized gambling, practicing greed and favoritism, and channeling thousands of dollars for his own gain. In March of 1957, during the murder and disappearance of Mr. and Mrs. Geddes Lee, Baden and State Attorney Max Smiley were at odds with who would handle the probe. Soon, Baden was in hot water with Governor Leroy Collins and was finally suspended from the office of Sheriff of Manatee County. Following this, Manatee County hit a moonshine operation that was said to be the largest in the state, along with gambling operations of Belita tickets being sold openly on the streets with no fear of police interference due to almost complete absence of arrest for Belita and moonshine activity for a long period of time. Mrs. Shire told me, I used to go to the courthouse with my father and sit on Roy's lap. He would often give me a quarter to get an ice cream cone at Sharp's Drug Store, which was across the street. It was right after the bodies were found that my father went on an unexpected trip to Alaska. She believes Roy Baden and her father could have possibly been involved in the murders somehow, though she hopes not. Just one of the many theories out there concerning why the Lees could have been murdered. Apparently, Mr. Lee was also involved in the illegal trading of moonshine stills and Belita tickets, which were a huge deal at the time. He supposedly had stills, and so did Roy, she said. It could have had something to do with what Geddes knew, or him not paying the sheriff for protection. Mrs. Shire also claimed that Roy Baden would have the stills demolished by his deputies. Her sister remembers watching her father destroying them as well. She wants to know the truth of what happened to the Lees, even if her father was involved. With all of this in mind, it surely doesn't make our sheriff look very good, especially because this was all stirring up around the time of the Lee murders. And with this, what do we have? A rich man, unloyal to his wife, shrouded in mysterious gambling and moonshine trade behind closed doors, is found dead years after his wife's murder and years of being missing. That's it, really. The police have not checked out this case at all since it's happening, mostly because of the time in which it happened and how little clues we are given. Why were Geddes and Merrill Lee murdered in cold blood? And by whom? Well, ladies and gentlemen... This is where it seems our search ends. The trail just stops here. All we really have are the facts of the case. We might as well just give up. We have nothing else to go on. I guess this is the end of the documentary. Not a chance. We are not done here. There are many thoughts feelings, and opinions scattered about as to why on earth Geddes and Merrill Lee were killed, and we have not discussed them yet in detail. Here are some of the popular theories surrounding the Lee's deaths. To begin, we have the first theory that people have begun throwing around there at the time of Merrill's death and Lee's disappearance, that Geddes himself had murdered his wife and tried to flee the country. Geddes' mother strongly protested this idea, insisting someone had killed her son as well. It indeed seems to be the most unlikely, mostly because Lee's own body was found later on, and that he really had no reason to do such a thing. I mean, what did he have to gain from doing something like that? With an entire orange grove, hundreds of cows, and grocery store all under his name, it would be ridiculous. A more likely possibility, though, would have been for his riches. Lee was wealthy, and that was no secret. Carrying around thousands of dollars in your pockets is a good way to end up robbed, and this is why some speculate he was killed for his money. As we know, Lee was also rumored to be a womanizer. His constant meddling with young mistresses could likely have stirred up some trouble with the relatives of his lovers. It could have been a crime of passion, some say. An angry husband or father, maybe, upset that this older gentleman was taking the young women as his mistresses. 
a reason to murder him for his sinful and quite disgusting behavior. But that leaves his wife, Meryl. Why kill her as well? What had she done wrong in this situation? Should she have paid the same price for her husband's actions? No. There's too many holes in these theories. Too many inconsistencies with possible intent that causes me to question. Then, my friends, we have the gambling and the moonshine. Bolita, Spanish for little ball, was a lottery popular in the latter 19th and 20th centuries. In it, 100 numbered balls are placed in a bag and mixed up and people bet on which number would be picked out. The game could be rigged though, sometimes having more than one ball of the same number or taking out balls of a certain number. Some would cheat by filling the ball with lead so it sank to the bottom of the bag or putting a ball in ice so the person selecting the ball knew which one to pick. This game was highly illegal in Florida, but bribing law enforcement and politicians kept the game running behind closed doors. The game ignited what people call the era of blood. Millions of dollars were waged annually in Tampa, leading to bloodshed later on. Historian Tony Pizzo found out about at least 40 Belita killings in Tampa. Hillsborough County Sheriff's Office Vice Squad was trying to break up the rings of Belita gambling in Tampa 1959. Some speculate that Geddes Lee's involvement in these gambling schemes could have been what led to him and his wife's gruesome murders, as this was something very dangerous and sneaky that was going on around that time. Moonshine Stills Moonshining was the second most profitable racket for organized crime in the 50s, the first being Belita gambling. The illegal alcohol trade flourished during Prohibition. Premium liquor was delivered to Tampa on boats from Bimini, Cuba, and Nassau. Premium liquor was available for a huge price and people in Tampa settled for moonshine, setting up secret stills in the rural areas along rivers. Cracked corn, barley, and wheat was filled in a barrel with sugar and water filling it as well. The mixture was then left to ferment until the grain settled. Then the liquid was put on a cooking pot and watered down some. More than 38,000 gallons a year of moonshine was made in Hillsborough County. As we know, Mr. Geddes was also a part of this illegal trade of alcohol, and so was Roy Baden, and his deputies around the time Geddes was murdered. Miss Corin Shire's father was one of these deputies and helped destroy some of the stills. A grocer and his wife caught in schemes of love affairs, wealth, gambling, and alcohol trade murdered with no evidence as to who did it. We have the facts, and we have the theories, but I am not satisfied. I want the truth! And this, my friends, is where I ask for your help. Most people around during that time are long dead, as the killer may also be. But with the help of you all, and the seemingly unending power of the internet, I know there is someone out there more intelligent than I to help us solve this mystery and to find who did it and why. If you have any information regarding this 65-year-old cold case that would be helpful to solving it, or know someone who does, please send me an email at chickenmilkinfo at gmail.com. So now, I simply ask the question. <laughs>